Then if you want to flip that prayer request list over, and if you have a Bible and you want to go there, we are going to start in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We have for uh, several weeks now been looking at what does the Bible say about blank. Now they stole this this last Sunday, the youth did, because they want to be like us. But we have been talking about what does the Bible say, and then we fill in a certain social issue. And so many of you have given me, hey, let's talk about this, let's talk about this, let's talk about this. And so I'm just working off of that list as far as what does the Bible say about particular subjects, what does the Bible say about particular issues. So we have spoken about the authority of God's Word, which is why we're using God's Word then to answer the question. We've talked about the sufficiency of God's Word and why God's Word is enough to then give us the answers and give us the direction that we need on how we should live and how we should operate. Um, we've talked about anxiety. We've talked about depression. This morning or this evening, we're going to talk about self-harm. And this is a conversation that someone said, hey, we would like to talk about what the Bible says about self-harm. So sometimes it may be a little difficult to say, well, what is? How are we going to define self-harm? So on those notes, I gave you three different definitions from three different secular sources. Um, psychology Today said it's the act of deliberately inflicting pain and damage to one of the body. Um, the Cleveland Clinic says it's pretty much you're hurting yourself on purpose. Psychiatry.org says you see intentional self-inflicted damage to the surface of the body. So anything that you do to yourself for the purpose of harming or hurting yourself would be into that category of self-harm. Now, what are some things that people do that would be classified as self-harm? Well, there's several methods. I put three that I put three of those down there, but there's more methods than just those three. So you have you have cutting, um, which is where you you cut the skin and uh, you cut the skin in order to bleed. Um, and you may cut the skin multiple times. You may cut the skin at different depths. You may cut the skin at different places, but cutting, um, then you have burning. Um, there's some things, you know, years ago they would take the cigarette lighter and they get the cigarette lighter really red hot and they'd stick it on themselves someplace and like brand themselves. Or even now you have young people that are actually, you know, taking like a, a clothes hanger and, 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 and molding that into a shape and then, and then branding themselves. And Rachel's giving me this look like, why in the world would somebody do that? Because they do it on Yellowstone. And Yellowstone, it's really big on Yellowstone of being branded with that, that Y. And so that's kind of been made popular. But there is such a thing where you get, and I don't know about women doing it, but I have seen young men that it's like a popularity thing. They go out and they, you know, they get, they get some type of a brand. So burning or hitting just, just flat out like you think. You're slapping yourself, you're hitting yourself, whatever the case may be. So there's multiple methods out there, but those would be some methods if you're like, what are we talking about here? That's what we're talking about. Somebody that's cutting themselves, burning themselves, hitting themselves, harming themselves. Now this, these statistics uh, came from a two-year-old study. So this, this is dated, um, but the stuff that was more recent wanted me to pay for that information, and I really wasn't wanting to pay just for the statistics. So the two-year-old study that I was able to find and look at said, when it comes to, you're going, well, how important is this issue? How, how prevalent is this issue? They say 17% of people, all people, will at some point enter into some type of a activity or behavior of self-harm. They say the average age that a person starts um, engaging in self-harm behavior is around the age of 13. And amongst those, 45% um, of the ones that are engaging in self-harm behavior, are their cutting is their preferred method. Sometimes it can be with a razor blade. Sometimes it can be with a box knife. Yes? So one of the things that I, to kind of add on and to put into perspective, if we think about that number, that means that there are at the, at the very least two young people downstairs right now that are dealing with at that. least at the very least too. at least that's something that like I just thought I should throw. And I personally know of more than two that are down there Absolutely. that struggle with it. Yeah. Yes, with some with some version of self harm. So, as us adults, we may be in here going, 
why is this relevant to us? But I'm just telling you, when it comes to the life of the church, whether we talk about the young people that are upstairs or the young people that are downstairs, I know personally at least two that are down there right now that have struggled with this, what we're talking about tonight, self-harm. And when it, be, when it becomes exposed or when it becomes realized, then the question is, what do we do about it? What, what do we say to it? How do we address it? And many times it is, it is done in places that you're not normally going to see it. And many times it's done in a way that you would not readily um, recognize it. And so then the question happens, well, why are they doing it? What are they doing? How do we help them? How do we then counsel them to guard them from continuing in that behavior? Because the vast, vast majority of it is done in secret. It's not done and bragged about and talked about it. It's done in secret. So I think that's why it was suggested that we talk about what does the body, what does the Bible say about self-harm? Because, because this is something that our society is facing. This is something our church is facing. And this is something, whether it's your kids or your grandkids, your nieces, your nephews, your great-grandkids, maybe something that you have experienced. I don't want to be I don't want to assume that all of us in this room that none of us have ever dabbled in self-harm. I think it's something that um that affects adults just as much as it affects young people. And so, what does the Bible say about this idea of self-harm? So what I did there was you have got five what I put was five different statements. Now, these five statements come from what I have heard people say to me directly, okay? So maybe there's some other statements you might have out there, uh, but in the limited time that we have, we're not going to be able to be exhaustive about this. But these are some statements that I have heard people tell me when I have questioned them, challenged them, or confronted them. These are some statements that I've had. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at a statement and... Uh, this is the statement that I have been told, that I've received, and then say, okay, is there a Bible passage that talks about that statement? Because, because, you know, I think it's important. I think it's important that we think about these things biblically. And we think about how do we answer the questions, the concerns, the struggles from a biblical way. You're not going to open up your Bible and see an entire passage about the dangers of self-harm in that direct language like you would lying or like you would stealing, um, because that isn't a direct topic that the Bible deals with. But does the Bible deal with the attitude, the heart, the behavior, the mindset behind it? Yes. So that's what we're going to look at. So the first thing that sometimes you will hear people say that are engaging in, sympathetic to, or, um, or, or, or pursuing a lifestyle of self-harm, they will say, it is my body, I can do what I want. If I want to slice my buddy, body, if I want to cut my body, if I want to burn my body, if I want to hit my body, it is my body, I can do what I want. Well, you're in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Now, in all honesty, the context of this passage is not self-harm. It is about immorality. And it is the danger that comes when we have individuals, both male and female, that engage in sexual morality. There is a harm that is done to the body. All right. So what Paul is addressing in 1 Corinthians is that there was a, a pagan temple that was there. And he had a number of people that would go to the pagan temple. And they would engage in the cult prostitution. And they would engage in sexual activity with the cult prostitutes. And when Paul would address them, they're like, oh, that didn't mean anything. That was just, you know, that, that was up there with the pagans. It didn't have any harm to my body. It was, just, it was just a hobby. And they were just blowing him off. And so Paul says, no, you don't understand. The things that you do to your body matter. The things that you do with your body matter matters. The things that you expose your body to matter. So in 1 Corinthians 6, starting in verse 12, down through verse 18, he's talking about immorality. So I don't want, I don't want to mislead you and to say, oh, this has to do with self-harm. He is talking about immorality. But he gets down to verse 19, and I think, for me, the principle is still the same. Whether we're talking about sexual morality or we're talking about self-harm, the principle is still the same. He says in verse 19, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you are bought for price. So glorify God in your body. So when that individual looks and says, it's my body, I can do what I want. I would take him back to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and I would say, it's not your body. 
It's God's body. It's not your body to do with whatever you want, however you want. This is God's body. And when we engage in activity that is harmful to our body, and we knowingly engage in those things that then cause both physical harm, then they cause spiritual harm, and that is not glorifying to God. He says in verse 20, So glorify God in your body. So he's saying the things that we do with our body should be honoring and glorifying to God with our body. So someone says, it's my body, I can do what I want. No, it's not. So if you walk in, if you go into Jane Lee and I's house, and we've got um, three older boys in one bedroom, and I go in there, and they each have their own dresser. And on top of their dresser, they've got, that's kind of like their domain. But there's standards, there's rules. This is the top of your dresser. But there's still a certain way that you're going to keep the top of your dresser. And I've gone in there before and I've looked at one of those boys and said, that top of that dresser is not to standard. And they look at me and go, but this is my dresser and this is my room. Now, now they said it a whole lot more respectful. But maybe they didn't. However, the point is, the point is, okay, we all in this room are going, well, hold up a second. <laughs> that is not their room <laughs> and that is not their dresser. Right, that's right. So all of us in this room, especially the adults, we understand that that child says, this is my dresser, this is my room, and us as parents and adults go, no, you have been given the privilege of using that dresser in this room, but those aren't yours, okay? So that's what Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. This body... I can go around all day long and say, well, it's my body. I can do what I can do whatever I want to to my body. And God goes, no, 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 no. You are a steward. Okay? I am giving you the privilege of living in this body and having this body. But ultimately, this body belongs to God. And so sometimes we need to think about it in that way of if somebody says, well, it's my body. I can do what I want. No, it's not. It is God's body. That's why he says your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. So this is not for everybody, but for the saved people that have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, your body is a temple of the Spirit. So what it is, you have a gift from God. So if somebody comes in and says, whatever I do in a self-harm way to my body, it should be none of your business. It's my body. I can do what I want. You and I can come back and say, oh, well, um, let's clarify here. It's not your body. God's body, and you have not been given permission to run around and intentionally, willfully harm God's body. That, that, that's, that's, that's not something that has been permitted in the Word of God. So somebody may come and say, well, it's my body, I can do what I want. Or they may come and they may go to the second one, and they may say, it's my choice. It's my choice what I choose to do. It doesn't affect you, so bug off. I can do what I want. So we talked about, well, it's my body, I can do what I want. Well, we have, a, we have an answer to that. And it doesn't matter, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how good your answers are. It matters whether they have a receptive heart or not. But they may say, okay, well, so I grant you that it's God's body, but still, this affects me, this doesn't affect you, move on. This, this doesn't have anything to do with you. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We say, well, okay, so yes, it may not negatively affect me, but... Your actions are indicative of your worship. So it's not a matter that your actions don't have an effect. They don't have an, they don't have an impact. They have nothing to do with anybody else around you. Uh, your actions reveal your heart. So he says in 1 Corinthians 10, and of course here he's talking about the, the legal things. And so 1 Corinthians 10 in the preceding verses, the question was, there was a certain amount of meat that were offered to pagans in the pagan worship. Well, then they would take that meat and they would sell it at a discounted rate in the markets. So if you're a poor family struggling to make buy and you went to the markets with the untainted meat, you, that was a price point, if you will, let's say a dollar per pound. And then if you went to the stuff that had already been offered as a sacrifice to an idol and then was brought back to the market, there's no difference. It was just this one had been offered to the idols, but because it had been offered, now they discounted and it's 50 cents a pound. So you go, I'm buying the 50 cents a pound meat, same meat, save money. Well, there were some Jews that were sitting there going, how could you do that? You were eating something that's been offered to a pagan god. And so was, there was this... 
struggle back and forth. Can you eat it? Can you not eat it? Are you right? Are you wrong? Back and forth. And so he says in verse 23, all things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. He says, yes, maybe by the code of the law, the letter of the law, it's legal, but that doesn't make it right. You might pull your toes in here for a minute. Just because marijuana is legal doesn't make it good. Just because alcohol can be legal doesn't make it good. Just because you have a prescription doesn't then give you an allowance to abuse it. There are things that why they may be legal that doesn't make them right or good in whatever your specific scenario is. So that's the question. The question is, can we do this? Can we not? And so there are some people that Paul was addressing that their attitude was, it doesn't, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't affect you. It doesn't have anything to do with you. Why are you worried about it? And Paul is coming back and saying, well, there's a bigger thing at play. So he gets down there in verse 31, and he says, whether you're buying the discounted meat or whether you're buying the full price meat, whether you're eating the discounted meat or you're eating the full price meat, whatever it is, he says, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. So if you run into somebody and they're engaging in a lifestyle or a pattern of self-harm and they go, you know what, it doesn't bother you. It doesn't affect you. You, doesn't have anything to do with you quit worrying about it you have an opportunity to go it may not affect me but it does reveal about you your heart your attitude and at some point it's not about what i can do i put that in your notes it's not about what i can do but it's about what i should do can i do things that i should not do yes can I do things legally that I should not do? Yes. So it's not always a matter of, well, is it legal or not? Or whether you can or not. Or it's not always a matter of, well, I'm an adult and you're not. Or it's not always a matter of what you think is right or wrong for you. The question is, is am what I doing bring glory and honor to God? And when you're dealing with somebody that is engaging in a pattern, a lifestyle of self-harm, that is not bringing honor and glory to God. Why? Because you are afflicting. You are damaging. You are hurting the body that God has given you. So they say, well, it's my choice. It doesn't have anything to do with you. And you say, yes, okay, grant that. But do you understand that what you're doing is... Not doing what God would have you to do, and that would be to glorify Him in everything that you do. I put there, our actions should be glorifying to God. Somebody that's going to engage or um, move into that pattern of self-harm, they're not doing it to glorify God. They're doing it um, for different reasons, but they're not to do it to glorify God. And so the question is, is not a matter of, well, as long as it's legal for you to do it and it doesn't bother me, then you can do it. No. It's not a matter of can. It's a matter of should you. You know, maybe, maybe, you, maybe you're not there. You know, sometimes you got that gallon tub of ice cream and you skip the bowl because the bowl is just too much work. And you even skip the cup because you're like, why mess with the cup? And so you got the spoon and you got the half gallon tub of ice cream and you're sitting there and you're like, uh, five or six spoons and then I'm done. I'm, I'm done. I'm going to go put it up, right? And then, you, and then now you're about 10 spoons in, okay? And you're thinking to yourself, well, they put all of this in the tub for a reason, right? And then you're thinking to yourself, well, you know, I was good yesterday. I deserve a cheat day, right? And, and you start going through these things, right? And, and at the end of the day, you're thinking to yourself, well, I can do this. And you come up with all these reasons to rationalize why you should do this. But the, really the question is, it's not a matter whether I can it's a matter of what's glorifying to God, what I should do. And so sometimes you'll talk to these people that are, um, these individuals, and they're, they're engaging in this lifestyle, just behavior, of self-harm. You can say, you know what, there, there's some bigger questions afoot. Not if you can or not if it's legal. To my knowledge, it is not illegal if I take a pocket knife and I cut myself. I, I haven't done anything illegal. And just because I can doesn't mean I should. Well, there's a third thing that you might hear when you're talking to um, individuals that are struggling with this pattern of behavior. Or they'll say something like this. It's just who I am. 
This is who I am. I was born this way. Kind of that attitude. I can't help it. It's not my fault. I, I can't control it. This is just who I am. And so they'll use this as an excuse to continue in a, uh, a, a pattern that is unbiblical. They'll just say, this is who I am. In other words, what they're saying is, this is now my identity. And you will see this come with people that are engaged in um, homosexual lifestyles. They'll say, well, this is who I am. I was born this way. Sometimes you'll run into this case when it comes to addictions. And people will say, I can't help it. I am genetically disposed to this attitude. Uh, my grandfather, um, one of the, um, not the cause, but one of the um, aids of his, or one of the things that aided his death was alcoholism. And so the idea during back there 25 years ago was that alcohol had some type of a genetic link to it and that genetic link would skip every other generation. And so the idea was is that if grandpa is, has the proclivity to alcoholism and has that kind of lifestyle, well then it's going to skip my mom's generation and it's going to go down to me. So somehow I am genetically wired for alcoholism. You know how to keep yourself from being alcoholic? You don't drink alcohol. <laughs> That's right. So, so when they, you know, so when they'd say that, they would just, you know, and I've heard my grandpa say so many times, "Well, this is just who I am. This is just how it is." My grand, my, you know, my great grandmother, his mother was an alcoholic. You know, his grandma was an alcoholic. This is just who I am, and they start to embrace this identity of this is who they are. Well, you can take them to a place like Galatians chapter two. Galatians chapter two, Paul is addressing their attitude about their salvation, their attitude about who they are now in Christ. <clears throat> and he says in verse 19 of Galatians 2, For through the law I died to the law so that I might live to God. Then in verse 20, For I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul is saying in that verse that once we have trusted in Jesus and we have been born again, our identity has switched. We went from the identity of being a lost person headed to hell, and now we are a saved person in Christ Jesus. That is our identity. Now, our behavior might mark us. Our behavior might have consequences. Our behavior might be evident in the lifestyle and the, and, and the attitude and the actions of what we do. But for the believer, our attitude is in Christ, not in our outward appearance. So if you have somebody that's sitting there and they're engaging in this behavior, or this pattern of self-harm, and they say, well, this is just who I am. I was born this way. I can't help it. You can go, no. That does not have to be your identity. And that's your, not your identity given by God. God has told us that our sin separates us from Him. And so there is such a thing as Matthew 25 would describe it as the goats and the sheep. You have the saved and you have the lost. And you have those on his right hand and those on his left hand. And so he says those are the identities. And so what marks us as a lost person is our actions of sin. Those are the things that mark us as a lost person. And it's not even has to be an identity. We are still created by God even in our state of lostness. We're still loved by God even in our state of lostness. We still have an opportunity to be reconciled to God, even the state of our lostness. And then once we come to God, our identity is now in Christ. And what did Christ do when he died? He died so that we might be free from, put down there, anxiety, depression, loneliness, and hopelessness. Hopelessness. Why to put those? Is because when they would ask people, why do you engage in self-harm? Some of the leading reasons that they give for why they engage in that behavior is to try to reduce their anxiety because they're looking for some type of a, a relief from their state of desperation because they're lonely and they're looking for something to bring them comfort and satisfaction or just because they feel hopelessness and they, in such despair, they're like, who cares? I want to feel something. I have heard people tell me before that they feel so numb emotionally that they're looking for some way to say, do I still feel something? So it's not for the attention aspect of it, like other people see it and then ask, what's wrong with it? Sometimes it will be. 
Sometimes they will do it for the attention because they want people to notice. Sometimes it's they are such in a dark place spiritually and emotionally that they, I mean, and I, 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 the young lady looks straight at me and she says, I just feel numb. Not numb as far as she feels, but numb emotionally and numb um, just mentally. She just felt numb and she was like, if I cut myself, would I feel sad? Would I feel anger? Would I feel hurt? Would I, would I feel these things that she just was so numb to? That's a struggle for me because I don't have to cut myself to feel angry. I just got to drive down the road and, and see, see, see people drive silly. And then I, 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 I don't have to do that. But, but that was the rationale that was given. And, and reading the studies about the self-harm, you know, they said that some of the respondents, as far as when they gave reasons why they did it, it was these were the, some of the reasons why they gave. So there's both and. There, On the inside of their thigh. They can't hurt themselves. They're not trying to kill themselves. They're just trying to hurt themselves. And some of it's just relief. I just, um, I had a friend in high school that she cut herself. And I feel like, you know, looking back, um, that she was maybe going through some depression. And I think she was having a hard time expressing herself or she just felt trapped. Sure. And so that's kind of my personal experience I've had with sure. this, you know, what she went through. Sure. And, and sometimes, and sometimes you and I might be tempted to go, well, that just seems odd. Well, it's, it's also odd to me that some people find relief from the stress of life by going to the mall and going shopping. I, I, you know, I'm, and I'm not, I'm not trying to make light of those individuals that are struggling with cutting. Please don't, please don't misunderstand me. I'm just saying that some people go, I'm stressed and I've got a lot going on. I'm going to go spend money at the mall. And I think that does not relieve stress in my life. Okay. <laughs> that, that adds to the stress in my life. Okay. Some people go, you know what? I just have a lot going on. I just got, I just got a lot on my mind, a, a big burden. I, boy, I'm just going to go exercise. I'm going to go run seven miles. Seven miles doesn't help me feel better. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Well, I think that one of the things that we have to remember, like the, the definitions that you've given on here are really good. Deliberately in hurting yourself, causing damage to your body. And we think about, like, when you think about self-harm, you think about cutting, burning, you know, those types of things. But there's so much, it's so much deeper than that. And a lot of people don't think about, like, overeating in response to not being able to feel or not, you know, not being able to handle your emotions. There's a lot more to self-harm than just making yourself weak That's right. or scarring yourself. And, that, and it may be even more dangerous than sure. you know, causing this. Yeah. yeah. And that's what I was saying. You know, some people, instead of cutting themselves, they overspin themselves right. into a crisis. Or instead of cutting themselves, they will overwork their bodies into just where they're just wasted away because they're so run down um, just, or some people will sit there with that half gallon of ice cream and say I'm going to sit here watching um, One Tree Hill until I feel better right <laughs> he, he, he's a One Tree Hill guy I can tell by looking at him he's a One Tree Hill so, so, so you'll have those people and so self harm isn't always a cut self harm can be life decisions that are Maybe not physically harming you, but life, but you can also have life decisions um, that bring um, problems into your life. Now, um, that's not the definition they give there. They're talking about more in a physical sense. But there are a lot of people that will self-harm in other ways or, or maybe self, um, self-sabotage self themselves in other ways. And so maybe if you and I are sitting here going, well, why in the world would somebody burn themselves? That just seems odd. After you just got back from the mall, um, just we need to have a we just need to have some grace, okay? Need to have some grace across the board. So there's another one down there. Now the number four, number four. Um, I don't feel like this is wrong. So somebody may look at you and go, you know what? I don't see anything wrong with it. I don't think this is wrong. 
why would give, God give me the desires to do this if they were wrong? And so they'll look at it and go, you know what? It's my body. I can do what I want with my body. It doesn't negatively impact you or affect you. It's really none of your business. And you know what? I want to do that. And why would God put inside of me that I want to do it if it wasn't okay for me to do it? So you'll have that question and they'll throw this back in your face. Well, um, you continue on there in Galatians chapter 5. And starting there in verse 16, Paul writes and he says, But I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. So he's talking about we have two different paths. Every single one of us in this room, we have two different options. Either we can walk by the Spirit or we can walk by the flesh. A or B. That, that's, that's the way we got Walk by the Spirit or walk by the flesh. So then the people go, well, how do we know whether walking by the Spirit or walking by the flesh? So he then goes on in chapter 5 and gives us an explanation. This is how you can tell the difference between walking by the Spirit and walking by the flesh. But he sets it up in verse 17 and he says, why does it matter? Verse 17, for the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these two are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. So what is he saying? He is saying that you have the spirit and the flesh. They are opposing one another. The flesh is trying to contradict the spirit and the spirit is trying to counteract the flesh. They are different. So if a person sitting there and going, I feel I have this desire that I want to do this thing, then you may say, well, the, the desire may be from the flesh or it might be from the spirit, right? Because both of them are demonstrating, both of them are manifesting desires. So you have desires of the flesh that say, do things that satisfy the flesh. And then you have the desires from the spirit that say, do the things that, desire, that the spirit desires. So just because you have the desire doesn't make it automatically okay. Just because you have the desire doesn't make it good. Just because you have the desire doesn't make it right. The fact that you have a desire does not prove whether it's right or wrong. It just simply proves that you have a desire. Okay? So sometimes we start to think, well, if I didn't have this desire, then, or we assume that every desire we have, God gave us, and so therefore every desire we have is good. That's not the way that works. That's not the way that is, that, that's, not, no, that's not the way this thing plays out. Just because you have a desire doesn't mean it's from God. And just because you have a desire doesn't mean that that is what is pleasing to God. So he says, these two are opposed to one another to keep you from doing the things you want to do. So he goes, verse 18. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not in the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. So he goes into this whole list about the works of the flesh, the things of the flesh, sexual morality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, robberies, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So he says, these are the desires of the flesh, and these are the behaviors of the flesh. These are the actions of the flesh. These are the things that you do that are not of the Spirit. And then you go to verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love Okay, so those are the things of the Spirit, all right? So he says, you have the things of the flesh, you have the things of the Spirit. So when you and I are sitting here and going, I have a desire. Okay, check, you have a desire. Is that desire from the flesh or from the Spirit? I don't know. Well, what is it wanting you to do? Uh, it wants me to punch somebody in the throat. Well, okay, sometimes, sometimes that desire is real. <laughs> Okay? Or, or sometimes you want to look at that child and just put your hands around their neck and squeeze until your hands get tired, right? All right? So, I mean, sometimes that desire is a real desire. And you set to yourself and go, well, if I have this desire, well, it's got to be from God. It's got to be good. No. You and I can look at it and go, well, what is that desire going to lead to? I punch somebody in the throat. What is that desire? Does that lead to joy? Well, maybe. <laughs> Does it lead to peace? So we, got, we can look at these things, right? I'm being a little silly, but we can look at these things and go, hey, 
If it's going to lead to these fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, if it's going to lead to these, then we know that those desires, if they're leading in that direction, we can go, hey, I have, I have room to continue in that direction. If the desires are going to lead me to what? Enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, robberies, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness. If we know that those are the desires, then what does that tell us? Those are desires from the flesh. Just because you have a desire doesn't mean it's right. Just because you have a desire doesn't mean it's good. Just because you have a desire doesn't mean God is saying, go punch somebody in the throat. And it doesn't mean that you have to do it. Absolutely. You might have a thought or a desire, but you don't have to actually. Absolutely. So just because... That's not what the verse says. So, so we, we've got to think to ourselves, right? We've got to think, just because we have a desire, like Miss Levita says, we don't have to act upon it, but we also need to discern that not every desire I have is from God in the sense leading me to do that. So sometimes when they say, well, I don't feel like this is wrong. So? Let's go all the way back to the Garden of Eden. I was going to say, when God said, don't. <laughs> sure. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So when we go to this list there in Galatians chapter 5, you know, when you talk about the fruit of the Spirit, we know self harm is not on there. So self harm is obviously not a fruit of the Spirit, so that would make it a desire of the flesh. So if somebody says, well, I feel like this, or I desire this, or I have this desire, so therefore it must be okay, we can, we can um, have some way to come back and go, just because you have the desire doesn't make it okay. And just because you, you, you want that doesn't make it right. And we, and we need to be mindful. We need to be aware that it's not a matter of our feelings. It's a matter of what is glorifying to God, what is feeding and fueling those those spiritual um, evidence that, that spiritual evidence that spiritual fruit okay last one you got to go back to the left to mark chapter five because sometimes sometimes they'll run through that whole list they'll say it's my body I can do what I want or they'll come back and they'll say well it's my choice it doesn't have anything to do with you bug off or they'll say this is who I am they'll talk about identity or they'll say well I don't feel like this is wrong or I have these desires that God has given me or they might try to come back and say well you know what it's not a problem I can control it anytime and I can quit anytime I want and and they don't see the danger in their actions Mark chapter 5. And just listen to the description about the demon oppressed man. So we've looked at this a while back. So Jesus calms the storm and he sets out on the, the dry ground. I think it's Luke records it as there being two guys there on the scene. Mark only records one guy. Um, but it talks about the state of the person. And it says in verse uh, doo -doo -doo -doo, 3... Mark chapter 5, verse 3, He lived among the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart, and he broke the shackles in pieces, and no one had the strength to subdue him. So they're describing this person that is out of their mind. They're describing this person under the oppression of a demonic influence. They're describing a person that has lost self-control. They have... They're, they're fully given over to a godless existence. Does that make sense? But listen to verse 5, how it describes his behavior. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying and cutting himself with stones. Please hear me. I'm not saying that if, you, that if you know somebody or if you've ever done it yourself or if you've experienced I'm not saying that self-harm is you're demon-possessed. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that there are things that we will engage in in our lives that we are being influenced by dark forces. We are being influenced 
by the things that are not from God and we'll be influenced to continue in a pattern, a lifestyle. Why? Because it is destructive and Satan is continually trying to destroy us. Christ is trying to redeem us. Satan is trying to destroy us. And if you or someone you know looks at that and says, you know what, I can control it. I can quit it anytime I want. You and I can look at them and go, well, why are you doing it at all? This is not a matter of I want to do it once and then not do it again. Or it's not a matter of I'm going to do it three times and I'm going to quit. Do you not understand this kind of behavior is destructive? And what is going on in this man's life in Mark chapter 5 Pattern after pattern, day after day, and next thing you know, he's under this oppression, under this influence, under this satanic effect, and it, and it comes out in his actions. And we got to be on guard with the things that we do and the way that we do it, and if we know it's a danger, stop it. And we know we shouldn't do it, quit doing it. And it's not a matter of self-control or dabbling or I'm going to do just a little bit. I don't know, maybe they're still like this. Um, when you put a hot wire fence up to keep in livestock, uh, the hot shot charger, does it still, does it still miss Scotty? Does it pulse? Yeah. Okay, so, so, <laughs> okay, so years ago, that sucker would sit there and it would pulse, you know, choo, choo, and it would send that electric current through that wire, okay? So when we're younger, uh, much younger, all right, we would sit there and we would try to, we would try to gauge, can you touch it in between pulses? All right, so that was the idea. The idea was, could you be fast enough? All right, so this, this wire's coming along here, and the idea was, you could hear it. Sometimes if you're close enough to the charge, you hear it, click, 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 click. And the idea was, can I touch it in between pulses and not get shocked? <laughs> I, I am embarrassed to report, I don't think that works. <laughs> Because I, to this day, have never been able to touch it without being shocked. Okay? So I had friends. I had friends that I think to this day are still liars. Because they, because they claimed, oh, look, I touched it. And they touched it so fast. And they said it didn't shock me because they were in between the pulses of the hot shot. And so they would, they would do it. And they would touch it so fast. And they'd say, oh, it didn't shock me. I'm like, it didn't shock you? Oh, it didn't shock me. And then I would, Chow! and then it would just knock the fire at me and I'm like you're lying and they go oh no 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 and then they touch it again and they look at me like oh it's no big deal right alright so you're wondering where I'm going you're wondering where I'm going. so, so let, me, let me bring you back to where I'm going okay so you want to know how dumber Spence could have kept from being shocked not touch the wire right not even go well I'm going to try to touch it in between the pulses or I'm going to try to touch it with you know I'm going to try to touch it so fast just don't touch the wire. Do you know the wire is energized? Yes. So you know how you stop from feeling the effect? You don't touch the wire. So there's some people that go, you know what, I can dabble in expense. I can control expense. I can, I, 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 I can engage in a limited way, but I always can quit. I always can control it. And that's what we always say when we're headed down the road of destruction. That's how it starts. Don't touch it. Stay away from it. Why? Because this is things that people that are spiritually dark, people that are spiritually depraved, people that are living a destructive lifestyle, self-harm are things that they are engaged in. So stay away from it. So then we get down here to maybe some, maybe some practical things that we think about today. I hope maybe these, these five, I, mean, I put these there as five statements, but I hope maybe these are some passages that you can look at. Um, maybe you can think of more that you could add to that, but hopefully that, that gives you an idea that the Bible has something to say, not necessarily about the, the, the physical act of cutting, but the attitude, the behavior, the mindset. The, 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 the heart behind it. Maybe the Bible does speak about the motivation what people are doing, why they're doing it, or why they're doing it, and, and what's concerning about what they're doing. So then we come back and I'll say, okay, so what about today? What does this mean for today? Well, I want to reiterate that this is a very serious matter. I don't want to take, I don't want you to feel like, 
or hear from me that I'm taking it for granted or I'm making light of it or I'm making fun of it. I don't want you to hear from me that I just take it flippantly or I think that anybody that you may know or maybe even yourself or maybe uh, maybe in the past or whatever, I don't want you to think that I am just belittling that or making light of it. It's a very serious matter. And sometimes, like you said, it, sometimes it's a cry for attention. Sometimes they're doing it because they want people to notice them. They want to get caught. They want to then... Um, get help. Sometimes it's a cry for attention. And so we need to be on guard. We need to watch. And when we, when that evidence is there that somebody is engaging in a self-harm behavior or self-harm lifestyle, we need to take it seriously. It's not a, it's not a matter of you and I just look at them and going, quit doing that. Quit being dumb. Quit being silly. No, we need to understand this is a very serious thing. And we need to, we need to come alongside them. Why is it that you're doing this? And not come down and then just start taking our Bibles and beating them over the head and go, well, you, blah, 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 blah. And, and I'm not saying you say, well, you're just, you're just wrong. And, and the preacher say, blah, blah, blah. we come alongside them. We show compassion. We show grace. We show mercy. Because sometimes it's a cry for attention. Sometimes it's an attempt for relief. Their circumstances, their environment, their world... It's so heavy and it's so burdensome that they say hurting myself gives me a relief from my situation. That's scary. And I think we should take that very seriously. so wrapped up in that in yourself that you want to find some relief for it. So you start looking in yourself, whether it be a pain relief or whether it be a pleasurable relief, then you start planning it, then you act out upon it, then you get remorse, you get back to that cycle again, and you continue to do that. I think one of the key things that I found is when you see someone engage in those behaviors, help them find a way to look outside of themselves. Yeah. The, 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 to, to see others, to serve others, to to become, it, it, it doesn't, I mean, you, you can preach to them all you want, but until you come outside of yourself and look outside of yourself, those behaviors, those desires are not going to go away. Yeah. Well, that's just like me. I can sit and think, I want a cigarette, but I know if I pick up that cigarette, I'm in trouble. Because I, no, really, I smoked for 32 years. And I'll be clean. But I, say, but I want to re, you know, repeat myself. It, it's a serious matter. Whether it's a cry for attention, whether it is an attempt to find some relief, or whether it's just doing it because peers around them are doing it and they want to see what it's about, or they because they think it's cool, or because they feel like they, um, everyone else is doing it, so they have to do it. And, and there's a variety of reasons. And it doesn't matter whether you think the reason is sufficient or substantial or not. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you think it's a legitimate reason. It doesn't matter if you think um, they've got good grounds. We've got to take this as a serious matter because it is not just affecting adults, but more so it's affecting our young people. And they don't, they're not going to be helped by you and I scoffing and dismissing them and blowing them off or lecturing them. That, that's not going to help because it's a serious matter. And then we also remember that it's a dangerous behavior. It's not something to just take lightly and go, oh, well, it's not a big deal. Don't worry about it. No, it is a very dangerous behavior. Not only is it a serious matter, but it's a dangerous behavior. Why is it dangerous? Because you have... And I'm not saying all the time, but 
by and large, the majority of people that are engaging in self-harm behavior um, do not have the maturity to know the difference between a deep cut and a shallow cut. They don't know the difference as far as anatomy on where the veins versus the arteries are at. The majority of them are just cutting someplace that they can't be seen. They're, they're burning someplace where it can't be seen. They're harming themselves in a way that they can hide it, but they don't understand that there can be lasting, permanent, physical damage done to the body. Those things can really take place, and their actions and behavior, it is dangerous. There's permanent damage. There's lasting consequences that come. I could take you to some guys down um, in Ringland, Oklahoma, that have an R burned on to their chest. And you can open it up, and 15 years later, that R is still visible on their chest because they were sitting there, and that was something you did. Um, down there, um, you... R was something that you got, and they still have that. Now, is that a debilitating consequence? No. But is it a lasting consequence? Yes. And when they start mutilating, they start harming themselves, there is the real possibility of lasting permanent damage. And so it's a dangerous behavior. So it doesn't matter whether the individual is 5 years old or 8 years old or 13 years old or 25 years old or 40 years old. That Whatever that is, that is dangerous behavior. It's not something that you and I just go, oh, who cares? And we go on. We've got to take it seriously and we've got to understand it as a dangerous behavior. And more, more so than that, like Peter already said, you're dealing with an addictive cycle. A lot of times that individual will engage in that behavior, that activity, and they'll, then they'll feel bad and then they'll feel guilty about it and then they'll say, I won't do it again. And then they'll get bored, and then they'll get tired. The moment will happen again, and they'll step right back to it. And they're, they're engaging in that addictive lifestyle. And I'm not saying that it's on par with heroin. I'm not saying it's on par, on par with meth. I'm not saying it's on par with cigarettes. Uh, they all have their own unique profile. But somebody that is engaging in a, in a, in a self-harm lifestyle, self-harm behavior, they're engaging in addictive behavior, and we need to be honest about it we need to be um, aware of it and we need to be ready to address it in the manner of what it is it's serious it's dangerous and it is not it's not addictive i'm not saying that it's addictive in the way that um, meth can be addictive what i'm saying is is that it is the same kind of behavior and so we need to think about when we respond to it let's respond to it um, with wisdom with grace with accountability with mercy, respond to it correctly and, and approach people correctly and, and deal with people correctly instead of just taking it for granted and saying, oh, well, we go on. Yes, ma'am. I was just going to say much. Yes, but because, because and, I've, and I've, I've heard this, I've heard this from people. You know, they start off with a cut this long and then they end up going to a cut this long, and then they end up going to cut this long, and then they go to two cuts this long, and they start trying to go deeper, and they start trying to use different devices, and we go, why in the world would you do that? Well, the same reason why somebody starts off with one beer, <laughs> and then a year later they're drinking three beers, and then a year later they're drinking a six pack, or somebody that starts off with so much marijuana, and they go to so much more marijuana, and they go to so much more marijuana because they desensitize and because they're looking for that new high and they're looking for that new threshold and looking for that new, that new challenge and that new feeling. And that's part of that addictive behavior is they will get in there and last time is not sufficient. They got to go more. They got to go, for lack of a better word, they're going bigger. They're going stronger. I mean, it's, they're having to up the ante every time. And it, yeah. What would you say, Stacy? Yes. Yeah. I mean, well, I hope in a perfect world, none of us would ever have to deal with it personally. We don't live in a perfect world. So when that moment comes, when that challenge comes, I hope that you will take it as a serious matter. I hope you'll take it as a dangerous behavior. But I also hope that you will not feel paralyzed that 
what do we do? What do we say? Um, I'm not saying that every answer will satisfy you. I'm just saying the Bible is sufficient for addressing attitudes, behaviors. The Bible is sufficient for dealing with the matters of the heart and the conditions of the heart. And the Bible is sufficient for giving us guidance and direction on how to put off the old self and put on the new self and how we can put away those things. And I'm not saying it's easy. I'm just saying that you and I will struggle um, if we're not spending time in God's Word to be able to respond to it in a biblical way. So that's kind of um, a 50-minute look at what the Bible has to say about self-harm. I'm sure there's more that's out there, but that's uh, kind of a, a place to stop off at tonight. So, so I'm grateful that you were here. Thanks for being here. And uh, I will hopefully see you this coming Sunday as we gather again for the Lord's Day. And so, so grateful that you were here and so grateful that you were a part of it. Mr. Stapp, would you be willing to close us in a word of prayer? Sure. And then we'll get our kids and go home.